On my seventh birthday, Mama gave me a King James Bible. It was hefty, like phone books used to be, but fancy. It was bound in black leather with pages that were gilded on the edge. My full name written in script in gold letters. I clutched the Bible to my chest and could smell the new leather and the fresh ink on the pages. I had a real adult Bible. I'd never been more proud of anything in my whole life. A few Sundays after that, our pastor, who everyone called Preacher Bob, asked the congregation to turn to Genesis chapter 19. Using the same steady hand I'd applied to a game of operation, I opened my Bible. The pages were so thin, like tissue paper, that I feared ripping a page, even on accident, would be a sin. Preacher Bob read the story about the two angels that went to visit Lot in the city of Sodom. Lot didn't realize they were angels. He just thought they were out-of-towners. So he invited them to his house and prepared a big feast. Now, while all this was going on, men, young and old, in the town came to Lot's door and wanted to know his guests. Now, I followed along in the scripture as the preacher's voice escalated in volume and vibrato, and he reached the peak when he boomed the words, Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. Now, Preacher Bob went on and on about sin and God's judgment and concluded his sermon with some even harsher words. And know that the Sodomites of today face a similar fate. Preacher Bob let those words wash over us. And I worried for the Sodomites. I mean, I didn't know who they were, but <laughs> I figured they probably slouched in church, so I sat up real straight, shifting my weight on the hard pew, feeling my tailbone against the wood. And at that point, I wish we were, were Presbyterians because they had cushions. <laughs> now, after the sermon in a Southern Baptist church, there's the invitation or altar call. It's a time when someone might come to the front and announce he's been saved, or a family would come forward and join the church. Every Sunday, the congregation sang, Just As I Am. The second verse was my favorite. Just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot. To thee whose blood can cleanse each spot, O Lamb of God, I come. While Mom and my dad sang along with the rest of the church, I was still wondering about sodomites. I read and reread Genesis 19, trying to figure out what Preacher Bob was talking about. I'd heard him use this term, sodomite, for years. But even after reading the Bible story about Sodom, I was no closer to figuring it out. After church, we went to Poe Folks for Sunday dinner. <laughs> Real southern cooking, like my mom would make. Now, I always got a veggie plate, and over my meal of fried okra, turnip greens, lima beans, and macaroni and cheese, I asked my parents, what's a sodomite? Now, my dad choked on his chicken, and my mama turned her head around, like she was making sure no one had heard me. She grabbed the back of her brown helmet hair with her fist, and pulled at it. Son, she put her hand on my arm. This is not appropriate conversation for Sunday dinner. Now, none of us said a word after that. And Mama moved her black eyed peas around on her plate and looked at Dad, bringing together the brown lines of mascara eyebrows that she painted on every morning. That night, when my dad tucked me into bed, I asked him again, What's a sodomite? He leaned over and kissed me on the cheek, and then sat down beside me. He chewed on his bottom lip for a few minutes before he began. He talked to me about body parts and holes, male and female, how men put their part in a woman's hole. But some people go the wrong way, he said. These people are funny. I didn't understand what he meant by the word funny. And that just didn't seem right. It wasn't the right description. Preacher Bob made the word sodomite seem worse than killing babies. And now my dad was telling me they were funny, humorous. 
I was no closer to understanding what it meant to be a sodomite. But my best guess, sodomites were clowns who murdered children. I just knew I didn't want to be a sodomite. Over the next three years, Preacher Bob reminded his flock at least once a month that sodomites, or homosexuals, as he started calling them, would be condemned to hell. I didn't think too much about them. I forgot about the conversation with my dad, about male parts and holes and everything. Until one day, when Mom and I were standing in the checkout line at the AMP, I picked up a Sports Illustrated magazine and flipped through, looking at the pictures of the top college football players. I remember staring at a picture of a quarterback and a spark hit me like I hadn't felt before. Not even when I had my first French kiss with Christy Fowler at a YMCA sleepover. <laughs> Our groceries moved on the conveyor belt, and I put the Sports Illustrated back on the shelf. Go ahead and get it, Mama said, and grabbed the magazine and put it on the conveyor. I reckon she thought she should encourage any interest I had in sports. A few weeks later, she even got me a subscription to Sports Illustrated. <laughs> now that was a huge mistake. <laughs> so when each issue arrived, I raced to my bedroom and searched the magazine for the Soloflex ad. I'm just going to take a couple seconds. No. That shirtless guy sitting on a workout bench, abs tight, pecs ripped, biceps flexed. Even though I knew it made me a sodomite, I jerked off to that picture almost daily. <laughs> but afterwards, I'd read my Bible and pray, Jesus, please cleanse my soul of this dark plot. I don't want to be this way. On Sunday nights, instead of a sermon, Layman testified about how Jesus had impacted their lives. One night when I was about 15, Preacher Bob asked Judy, a woman in her early 20s, to come to the front of the church. He handed her a microphone, and Judy fumbled with it for a few moments, before Preacher Bob came over and turned it on. The silence built up the suspense, and I sat up in the hard pew and leaned over so that I could see her better. Judy cleared her throat a couple times and then began, I left home at the age of 16, after my stepdad raped me. Judy had been a prostitute and talked about that lifestyle, and then led up to an admission. I knew that I couldn't keep the baby and continue to earn money, so I had an abortion. The gasps in the congregation sucked the air out of the room, and for a moment, I imagined myself up there talking about my story in 10 years, about how Jesus saved me from life as a sodomite. I squeezed my Bible so tight that I could feel the beating of my heart. Judy finished her testimony, Jesus Christ saved me, and I'm alive today because of him. And I thought, if Judy's sins could be cleansed, then certainly mine could too. Now for the first time since I realized I was gay, I felt a sense of relief about my feelings. I stayed up that night reading my Bible and praying, trying to find some passage that would be the magic bullet to heal me. But I didn't find anything that night, or any time over the next six years. My senior year in college, I came out to my parents. Within the week, they scheduled an appointment with a psychiatrist. We lived in Anderson and drove 35 minutes northeast to Greenville so that there would be no trace of these sessions. My dad paid the receptionist in cash. $300. This was 1991, $300 for the two hours. Each time I smell fresh money, I'm taken back to that moment, and I can hear the sound of the paper crinkle. His dad pulled a $100 bill out of his wallet and then checked to make sure there was just one, and then he pulled out another, and then a third, and then laid them on the table. I met with the psychiatrist for an hour, and then my parents met with him. And I remember walking back beside my mom into the car. She seemed in a daze. Her lips pursed, her eyes focused on the asphalt parking lot, she stopped halfway and pulled a Kleenex out of her purse. She looked up at the heavens and shook her head. She dabbed her eyes and I could see black streaks from her mascara on the tissue. That was wasted money, she said. I thought it could cure you. At that moment, I felt a sense of dread, like I was about to start on a very long journey. 
I asked my dad what the psychiatrist told him. He said, we can either accept you or reject you. The choice would mean having you as a part of our lives or not. Now the therapist's advice to my parents has been important to me the last 20 years. My first semester of law school, dad admitted to me that he'd been cheating on my mom with a woman just a few years older than me. His adultery had been going on for eight years at that time, and it went on for another seven after he told me, before he told my mother. I was angry at him for cheating on her, and even madder because he wasn't honest about his feelings. He took 15 years of mom's life, prime years where she could have found someone else. Mama called my dad's wife the W because she's too Christian to use the word whore. <laughs> Mama still goes to the same church, Concord Baptist, where Preacher Bob ran in about sodomites for 30 years, and the church hasn't changed much. Mama's church contributes to ministries whose objective is to bring wholeness to the lives of gay people because we are broken. When I was writing this piece, I realized I had no idea whether anyone at Mama's church knew she had a gay son. So I asked her. She reacted like I was crazy. No, I haven't told anyone. Not even your brothers or sisters. No, they would think less of you, she said. This revelation shocked me and disappointed me. I didn't expect her to start a PFLAG group in Anderson, South Carolina, but I'm angry at her for losing an opportunity to show her church and her community that it's okay to have a gay son, but that's probably not the way she feels, so I accept her silence. The $300 my dad counted out in that therapist's office had been worth it. I've accepted my dad's new wife because I want him to be a part of my life. Mama probably prays every day that Jesus will wash the dark blot of homosexuality from my life, and I've accepted that. They're the family I was born with, and they're the family I still choose. I want them to be a part of my life. Is that so wrong?